You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello, welcome back to the Claret and Blue podcast and our second episode of our now called Villa Rewind series. A lot actually, um, a lot of the graphic that you've put on it. Yeah, I didn't know it was going to be called that the last, time, funky, last yeah. time we did one of these. Yeah. Rewind. <laughs> Today's subject is Stylian Petrov and his attempted comeback in 2016. Yeah. But let's start with him signing for Villa and, and what his story was before. I feel like Stylian Petrov's career and his, who he is as a person is defined by his illness and what happened from, from 2012, 2013 onwards. Um, so let's go back to when he first signed for Villa. Now, you'd have to remind me when you were covering Villa as a reporter, were you like... The, I the hadn't man? quite... Um, no, I hadn't quite got there. I think I was actually covering Kidderminster Harriers still. Really? At the time. She's wow. obviously back in Kidderminster today with you. Yeah, you've done your homework. What year did he sign? <laughs> 30th of August, 2006. Uh, yeah. Martin O'Neill's first Villa signing, a four-year deal for £6.5 million. Yeah, I think there was a sense of excitement mm. as well because he was tearing it up at Celtic. Obviously, obviously O'Neill knew him well. I always, um, I got to know Petrov kind of reasonably well in a reporter, you know, club captain kind of a way um, for a for a couple of years. But uh, the thing that always amuses me was like doing my homework on him. Probably not back then, but around the, the first couple of couple of seasons that he was at the club. Um, you heard the story about how he how he perfected his English. But we became friends with somebody who uh, ran a burger van. In Glasgow, and I think he started helping out. That's a good story. Uh, and serving some of the customers, and that that helped him, you know, because <laughs> his English is absolutely impeccable. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. To be fair, I should imagine his Scottish is pretty good as well. If he's selling <laughs> burgers, uh, burgers in Glasgow, um, but I don't know. I, I like that. That's what I like about. He's a lovely fellow anyway. I like the kind of everyman quality mm. of footballers who are super rich, super successful, but still retain that that normal man charm really mm. uh, like you said I've done a bit of homework so forgive me if I'm kind of looking down and reading stuff at you rather than kind of remembering it with David Unsworth last time which was before my time obviously I remember Petrov but I've tried to put a bit of research into dates and times and stuff like that um, he didn't switch to the number 19 shirt to his second season 2007 which kind of became synonymous with with Petrov um, when I did the social post a few weeks ago about, you know, is he a hero and all those kind of things, there's a few people that are kind of suggesting that he's only kind of got that status because of what happened to him. What did you actually make of him as a footballer though and his performances? People were possibly expecting him to come and reprise the box-to-box role mm. that he got at, um, at Celtic. And he was never really played in that kind of a role at, at Villa. Um, I've said this before, he, he was Villa weren't lacking with kind of attacking flair players then. He's played regularly, consistently, week in, week out for a team that under O'Neill knocked on the door of breaking into the Champions League. You know, pretty close to three years, three years in a row with those three sixth place finishes. You don't just do that by chance. You Mm. don't do that if you're not performing a really important function for the team. Um, And I think, like I say, I think think sometimes he was judged harshly because he he, he wasn't the the goal-scoring, marauding midfielder that we'd seen on the highlights reels and on YouTube from from Celtic. Mm. But I think he came in, and and I've said this before as well, so apologies for repeating myself, um, Clareton Blue regulars, but I think he, I don't say he sacrificed himself for the team, but he did do that that very workmanlike kind of anchoring yeah. role for the team. And, you know, he still scored some belters. You know, the the one, the the, the Derby one will be the one. The one I've written down, yeah. That will, that will follow him round. Um, I mean, just to just to go on that, and his kind of his numbers in terms of goals and assists weren't weren't brilliant. But I mean, that wasn't really his position, was it? He was that kind of workhorse behind yeah. those crowded players. That goal against Derby in, in April of two thousand eight. That was his first goal of the season. Yeah. Which kind of summarises that yeah, he doesn't really offer much in terms of output, but it's it's the kind of unseen work, which is a bit of a, a bit of a cliche. But he offered a, a good kind of base for that team. Yeah, and the fact that he scored it from the air of the pitch where <laughs> he used to do most of his work <laughs> as well. I was the the Villa reporter from, or certainly covering Villa from, probably around, I don't know, March 2007, I think. Mm. Um, We used to get pretty reasonable access to Bodymore. We used to go up there once a week to to speak to the manager. And we used to go up there, you know, for press conferences outside of that. And we'd probably go up there for a a player interview as well. So that's three times, three times a week you'd be up there and you probably felt a little bit more of a part of it part of it back then and Petrov was it's funny because I remember there's a a lady who used to be on front reception 
called Christine, and she was really, really lo- lovely, really, really sweet lady. But Petrov used to drive her mad because he'd <laughs> always have, he'd be so demanding. You know, if somebody had parked not not necessarily in his space, but somewhere near his space, and he hadn't got. <laughs> <laughs> his particular routine, he'd come and moan at Christine mm-hmm. and expect her to sort it. You know, silly little things like the, if the, the canteen hadn't quite got what he wanted. And I think part of it was him just being a bit of a wind-up merchant mm. and just trying to <laughs> trying to give Christine a hard time. But the other part was the standards that he wanted to, yeah. to have set for himself and that he wanted to have for his, his teammates uh, alongside him. So he was very much a presence around the place back then. Um I remember he played me and there's a guy called Brendan McLaughlin who was on the Express and Stars, the Villa Reporter. Uh, and we used to like be kind of, you know, travelling pairs and stuff like that. And um, there was a table tennis table in the press room one week. Um, the, the players must have commandeered it or whatever. I remember Petrov playing playing us both at table tennis. And I think, uh, you know, even if we took a single point off him, <laughs> it was like the end of the world. <laughs> stuff like that, like super, super competitive. It's not, I, I would agree with some fans who say that his reputation and his status has been elevated by what he what he went through yeah, and what, what he conquered. And I think his, his status has probably been elevated in my mind through getting him, I'm not, not saying I'm a mate or anything like that, but getting to know him a little bit and knowing what kind of guy he was as well. But even, you know, with both of those two elements, he was still a fantastic footballer mm. and a fantastic servant for Villa. What kind of pressure do you think he'd have felt when he became captain? Obviously, Gareth Barry came before him, Martin Larson as well, uh, for the first time in the UEFA Cup. Do you remember who that was against, testing your knowledge, back to 2008? Oh, blimey, would it have been away? In, wouldn't it have been away would in Bulgaria, been, would it? it uh, well, I know the team. I don't know whether it was Bulgaria. It was away, so I assume you oh, are li- right. Not Livic, Luf, Luf, whatever was it. Litek, Lovic, Villa 1-3-1, yeah. Petrov scored in the 92nd minute. Go, Done my homework this week. Yeah, well, that was a good, good guess from me as well. <laughs> yeah, good, yeah, good knowledge. Um, so, Graham captain for the first time then, and and kind of took it from there. But yeah, any pressures? Do you think he would have faced up from the back of that? What What year was that? Two thousand eight. So, how old would he have been by then? <sighs> God, I've not done that bit of research. No, he'd have been late twenties, wouldn't he? So, he'd been late twenties. He'd have been. But he's prime, probably. Let's yeah, just say that. Yeah, it'd have been his prime. He'd have played in the Glasgow Goldfish Bowl. Pressure would have been something that he'd have he'd have thrived on rather than let it kind of trouble him. Basically, he'd done two four years in the Premier League. By yeah, so he's established Premier League player. You know, he was a established Bulgarian international. You know, from what I believe, what I'm what what I'm led to believe, him and his wife Paulina were almost like the kind of posh and becks. Yeah. Of Bulgaria, so he was used to used to living his life in the in the spotlight. So I think the probably pressure would have come from from himself with those high standards and replacing somebody like Gareth Barry, mm. who was such a such a stalwart and such a popular figure at Villa. Um, but in, like I said, in terms of the what he expected of himself and what he expected of his of his people around him, he was probably a captain in everything but name before then. Anyway, that was probably his best time in at the club I think 2009 that almost year really the calendar yeah. year um, Villa getting into sixth place um, semi-final of the FA Cup League Cup final club captain I think he was player of the year in 2009 as well um, so and I checked what his goals and assists and stuff were for that season his numbers weren't that great really yeah. but that was still probably his, his best year and his contributions as <coughs> sorry I've sort of been stalking that cough I was trying to wait for you to t- <laughs> wait just to finish the question but I thought I might have choked I don't know what I was going to say I don't, I don't think there was a question there just that that was his that was his best time and like I said earlier even though it wasn't kind of backed up with goals and assists he's still contributing a lot lot to the side and you know, there was that kind of little bit of a he was a bit of a Marmite player whether you liked him or you didn't, didn't rate him yeah. but I liked him, and I think he, I think he was a good captain after Barry as well. In a kind of say, two thousand nine was a good time for him. That was probably like the, the last good time. It was pretty much all downhill from there, wasn't it? Really? Well, yeah, it was two thousand nine ten was the time we got to the the final, mm-hmm. wasn't it? And we got to the semi final. I could just said yeah. Have you just? I was coughing, man. <laughs> that was as, as near as we've come to having a successful Aston Villa team mm-hmm. since. The last time we had a successful Aston Villa team, which was, you know, kind of mid nineties, late nineties, early noughties, you know, knocking under the door under under John, knocking on the door under John Gregory. In, in that shirt? It was in this shirt, yeah. That was a, a very good segue into that. I don't think it can be can be underestimated. There's probably people of your generation, Dan, young whippersnappers 
<laughs> young whippersnappers that like you who that's been as good as he gets yeah, yeah, that yeah. O'Neill era mm. uh, and he was pivotal in it so even if he was you know the water carrier rather than the the the, the main man or, or, or the main creative exciting hero I don't think we can underestimate the, how important he was mm. like I said like, it kind of all goes downhill from there and there's the obvious elephant in the room with the, the leukemia diagnosis but even before that under Julio as well which he spoke about in our podcast and I'll try and kind of intersperse some, some clips from that kept the captaincy under Julio but I think he suffered a knee and dream was out for a couple of weeks or a couple of months even Julio didn't quite I don't know whether he just didn't get on with him or he didn't rate him or whatever, but Sam McCoon in the January, I think it was, and then had that kind of almost battle with Petrov to say, well, he's my player to start now. Yeah. You've got to earn your way back in. And I think Petrov probably felt a little bit disrespected by that almost. Uh, I was playing well, but I found myself in a, in a very difficult situation. Obviously, he wanted to play McCoon uh, and he had the rights to do that, but he didn't have the rights to to drop me because I was playing well. But if you put my, uh, yourself in my shoes, is I was a captain. Uh, do I have to go and complain? Do I have to go and sh- show uh, faces? Do I have to go and pretend that I'm not happy? Well, I, I couldn't do that because by that time, I've earned a quite uh, a good respect. Uh, the, the players were trusting me. The players were asking a lot of questions. I've become their mentor and their friend, which is more important than anything else, uh, Matt. So for me, I had to make a really difficult decision. Do I become uh, still in Petro, the captain who can don't care about the players, don't care about the club anymore and just, just do what I want to do and I could just leave? Or maybe I have to continue and be the man that I've, I've, I've always shown. Uh, dependable, trustful, and uh, reliable. What I had to do this three and a half months, I have to go every day. I was in, I was burning inside out. So, I mean, you can imagine, you know me, you knew me as a person, as a player as well. So I was burning inside out and uh, I couldn't show that. I had to go every day with a smile in training. I had to work harder than everybody else. I had to prove him wrong. With what Julio was trying to create there, a disciplined squad who live life the right way who you know just kind of were consummate professionals Petrov was that yeah really strange isn't it so and actually I'm not saying that Petrov didn't or wouldn't have helped Julia if he wasn't in the team and he wasn't in his plans at that time but I know Julia had a couple of scrapes with the likes of Richard Dunn and James Collins and Gabby Bonahor who probably were typical British footballers um, I think if he'd have trusted trusted Petrov a little bit sooner, Petrov probably could have helped him mm. win that battle and change that, you know, set that culture in the dressing room. Um, but it is, it's credit to Stan that he didn't. Um, I'm sure he did. I'm sure actually he probably did sulk. No, in Stan, he probably <laughs> did, did sulk and moan his way around the, the training ground. But his response was just to knuckle down, crack on, and. and and force his way back in. I mean, it probably helped that that McCoon <laughs> didn't really live, didn't live up to anywhere near the expectations that we had of him and that Julio had of him. So mm. there's a bit of an open door to kick at, really, in terms of Stan getting back into the team. Uh, but yeah, I think he, he, he put his nose out of joint as if to say, "Come on, you know, cut me some slack here. You mm. know, I deserve to be in this team." Petrov was born in in '79, so my, is my maths right that he'd have been 31 in 2010? Yeah. 31. Yeah, McCoon was four years younger. So is there a case to say from Julio's side of things? He was thinking, well, Petrov's heading into his thirties. I mean, he was he was just on a new deal in the in the two thousand nine season, though. So yeah. it's not like this player Petrov's running out of contract and he can kind of get rid of him easily. He would have had three years left on his deal. Thirty one's not exactly old, but kind of from Julio's point of view, he's maybe thinking, well, McCoon's from the French league. I've spotted something there. He's a few years younger. He's my guy. I trust him. Is that a fair kind of other side of the coin? Possibly, if it hadn't been from a manager who then went on and signed Robert Pires. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <good> <laughs> um, it was in his late 30s by then. Julio wanted to stamp mm. his mark on the dressing room. And whether he saw, whether he thought that Petrov was very much an O'Neill man yeah, and he, he wanted to bring his own. Julio would have thought when he joined Villa that he wasn't signing up for nine months, that he's probably signing up for five years. Yeah. Um, so it was probably a change of, probably a, a, a case of wanting to kind of be a change into the guard. Um, but then, like you said before about Petrov and the standards that he sets, that's, that's not a player to kind of alienate. That's somebody that you should still want to 
keep around. It doesn't. I can't really find an argument. I'm trying to kind of excuse who they are there, but I can't really find an argument that that justifies kind of icing stand out like that. No, he'd have, had his, he'd have had his reasons for doing it. I mean, I think that we've got to say is credit to Petrov for kind of fighting the good fight and, and, and forcing Julia to change his mind mm. and for Julia for being open enough to say, I got it wrong. Yeah. You know, you're back in, you know, you're important to me. At the end, he was a person who came and shake my hand and he said he was wrong with the decision. But he was really, he was really relieved and really happy that I stood and stood like a, like everybody else would tell him what kind of person I was. But he had to underst- understand himself, and he managed to do that. He shake my hand, he apologized, and he said, "You know, I was wrong, and I'm glad that you didn't give up on me first and in the team." I was quite happy. I was, I never had problem with any manager. I know that they had to make decision, but overall, if I had to sum it up. I would say he was, he, he's a very positive manager who I've learned a lot. He he taught me a lot as well. The leukemia diagnosis. What do you what do you remember of that? I know the story of obviously it was McLeish. Then so we kind of fast forwarded a lot of time there. Yeah. Um, that must be a difficult situation, obviously to to hear about as fans and as people, but to report on as well and be working on. It's a difficult story. The turn of that year, I think he scored, didn't he, away at Chelsea? I think we went and won three one at Chelsea on. Uh, on New Year's Day, um, and he was just ticking along fine. And against Arsenal, Villa Villa played. I think it was Petros' final game. Um, played against or final competitive game, if yeah. you like. Played against Arsenal away. I think we lost three um, nil. Mm-hmm. Just it's a bit of a battering, but it was a collective, a collective thing. You know, Petros didn't play well, but. Nobody, nobody, nobody played well. It'd be interesting, actually, for me to look back through my player writings and see mm-hmm. see how harsh, yeah. how harsh I was on him. So and I had a wee kind of tete a tete at half time, and I thought, "What's up?" Then you know, you, you look off the pace, and he says, "Oh well, just take me off then." And he was going to come off, but he, you know, he said, "Look, boss, well, you've got nothing on the bench, not except the young boys. It didn't mean nothing in terms of the." the you know, the way they could play. He says, you don't have the experience, I'll play in the second half. I says, you sure? You know, and uh, he played and, you know, he kind of wasn't the, the still in that we knew. And after the game, I, I stayed in London and Ian McGuinness phoned me and said, look, I think you were right about still in. He's, he's got a, a temperature and... Um, I took his temperature and he's probably got a wee dose of the flu. The doc said to him, we'll see you in Monday. So I saw him on Monday as well. He's on the bike, uh, warming, you know, the warm down Monday. And uh, I says, I told you, and you know, was there, you know, you, you, you weren't quite yourself. And he says, ah, you're right. Well, she was right. And uh, well, I was a bit yeah, stubborn. And, you know, on the Tuesday, Ian McGuinness took him for the blood test and they gave us the bad news and then all of a sudden, you know, football didn't seem important anymore. We were at a press conference at Bodymore, the back end of that following week and um, myself and Neil Moxley, who works for our company, um, works for the Nationals, for the, the Mirror and the People, giving McLeish a bit of um, a bit of a grilling basically because... Villa had been so poor at Arsenal and were on such a poor run of form and it looked like relegation was mm-hmm. a very real possibility that I think it was the first time that we properly got stuck into him a little bit. True McLeish, he was very um, very professional and wouldn't lose his rag and very respectful the way he answered and that kind of thing. Uh, but knowing what we know now, that he'd had this... Um, well, something that's not in the manager's manual mm. to deal with throughout that week. Um, and he knew that he was going to have to front that news and to the rest of the dressing room and the, the rest of the people at the club and the public um, and having to guide and support Stan as his manager and as a kind of fellow human. For, for McLeish to have dealt with me and me and Mox just kind of asking him what in his mind must have been fairly pointless and pathetic <laughs> questions. Yeah. Um must have been must have been horrible for him. And I remember him going out of the room 
And um, Brian Dugan, who was the club's press officer at the time, advised us all to stay, stay around because McLeish wanted to come back and speak to us. And what, thought, what did you think that was about at the time? I, th- oh, I don't know. I probably thought it was probably. No, I probably thought it was. You know, he's going to come back and have a word off the record and okay. say, like, <laughs> you know, I'm doing my best there. <laughs> I'll answer you. You know, I'll, I'll probably give you a little bit of information off the record about what's going on with the club and stuff. But just kind of <laughs> don't batter me too much with what you write. Um, but so he came back and I don't think he was taking questions again. I think he just got a prepared statement and he kind of probably stayed and had a cup of tea with us and, 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 and talked us through the process and what had gone on and stuff. Um, and then it all just became, it all just became so real and so horrible. Everybody needs to be calm and, like, you know, let's hope the press and everybody who are naysayers get behind us and um, that we, we stay in the Premier League for Stillian, we we were fighting quite a battle after that, and we had some really really strong performances um, despite the setbacks that we had. I think we probably should have pictures in our archive of of Stan sitting there with his his wife Paulina and um, his two kids um, in one of the directors' box, and you know you can. My memory is that you can see the see the tears. Yeah, I think you can. in his eyes. As, so I think his his wife might be even wiping a tear away. Yeah, in one picture as, if I can find it. As it pans, as the camera pan pans across to them, and from then on, it just became a thing. Mm. Um, every single week. I mean, I'm probably jumping forward a little bit, but I think it might have been the end of the following season, which was Lambert's first season, mm-hmm. when I think there was a Petrov tribute day away at Wigan yeah, um, the masks and everybody you know there's 4,000 still in Petrovs staring back at you from the from the the away end did um, the 90th minute applause last for that entire season as well because it seemed to last a long I think time it did. I, I don't want to be, like, be disrespectful of anything I thought I liked I liked it I think it was a touching yeah. thing to do but I seem to remember there being some moments of like we've got to stop this at some point kind of thing so did it was it still going by I then I think so I think I think it was, and I think it was. I was travelling home and away with Villa as the as the club reporter um, back then, and the thing that struck me was that people properly, you know, home fans or opposition fans at Villa Park properly joined in and and and, and, and gave it gave it proper amount of respect. I think, I think it it rocked it rocked football. Um, I know we've had the the situation with the lad at Bournemouth, haven't we? Really mm. um, recently. Um, and I think he's the last I read. He, he's he's doing well with with that. I think it was just such a a shock to football to have a fit, healthy athlete. You know, you know. I know it's a cliche, but it just it, it just shows that it you know horrible horrible disease doesn't discriminate. And if somebody who lives their life as this kind of absolute professional like Stan is vulnerable to it, you know, we all are. As much as we want to support him in his, you know, in his recovery and his battle with it, it was a it became kind of ambassador for it as well. We wouldn't want it to happen in those circumstances, but it brought to attention, you know, how we could try and try and raise money and awareness to try and get research into into leukemia and blood cancer, so that other people, you know, wouldn't have to go through what what he went through. So it was just a it was just a weird a weird weird time because. We knew what Petrov, the footballer, was was all about, but we found we, we at that time learned a really, really interesting lesson in what foot, what Petrov, the man, was like. Mm. When you've given everything uh, to become a footballer, when you give all your youth to work and develop and uh, have only one target uh, and one direction to become uh, a top athlete, and all of a sudden that's been taken away for you, and the uh, only question you get is, how is your health? How are you? Um, it's it's really painful, but in, a, in the same hand, in the other hand, uh, you know, it's good because I can answer with uh, with a great answer. With I'm well, and everything is going well, which uh, which was very difficult for me to accept at the start. Which is a great question to start with. Obviously, a difficult time for for the other players at the club as well, fighting a relegation and going through a period where the manager isn't popular, getting booed every every five minutes and stuff like that. You know, like I said, a difficult spell, and then you've got this stuff happening in the background as well. 
and yeah it can't have been easy can it for, for the rest of the players and you don't really hear about that side of the story I know obviously this is about Petrov but there's you know, a group of 20, 30, 40 people at Bodymore that this would have, would have affected as well yeah, it must have been a strange time. I think that that match was the the first time Jack Grealish made the the, the, bench, wasn't he, the yeah. match day squad as well. So you know, wonder, wonder what he'd have thought. But yeah, he was he was popular popular figure in that dressing room. He was the captain. He did have the interests of the 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 wider squad at heart, and not not you know not he wasn't ever a kind of selfish or self serving player. So he it would have had an impact, and it wasn't just the the players around him I remember the the two masseurs they did a a, a bike ride in you know a, a kind of pedal for Petrov um, <coughs> campaign excuse me <laughs> touch the it touched the dressing room every bit as much as it touched the the kind of fan base and the wider football world yeah I remember that being really emotional especially that first 19 minutes applause but obviously everyone after that as well um, I want to kind of skip forward a little bit because obviously the, the story of Stan Petrov is about to come back as well and we're half an hour into this and we haven't <laughs> even got to 2016 yet. So August 2nd, 2012, it was announced that Petrov's leukemia was in remission, which was obviously great news. And Paul Lambert was kind of keeping him around the squad and he was back. I don't know if he was on the bench listed as a player for that Wigan away game, but he was back like on the bench with yeah. coaching staff at least. And he was wearing like a tracksuit jacket and stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, applauded the pitch the Petrov masks and stuff like that and then his retirement announcement came as well and he kind of walked onto the pitch with his with his family at Villa Park yeah. for the last game or the last home game it's, it's a shame to see him retire obviously but it was always it was always coming wasn't it I don't think there was ever a, a realistic thing that he would get back into into playing as much as we would all have hoped he would you know, I kind of I'm kind of maybe misremembering but I kind of seem to thought well He's got this thing. Yes, he's getting better now, but he's surely never going to play football again. Yeah, I didn't imagine he'd even attempt a comeback at that stage. I think it was still the, the main thing was making sure that he could extend his life yeah. and have a, have a have a good quality of life. It was a strange quirk of fate, really, that Lambert was the one who followed McLeishin because obviously Lambert knew Petrov from their mm. their days at Celtic. You know, um, former former teammates, and I think I think Lambert. <laughs> Is a compassionate enough man that even if there hadn't been that pre-existing relationship, that he would have <clears throat> welcomed Petrov, you know, to the to the training ground and still be a part anyway. But I think that the fact that they did already have that relationship, Lambert offered him, you know, the chance to come and observe some of the coaching sessions and to, you know, not say give him the free run of the training ground, but, but was always welcome to yeah. to go there. I remember bumping into Petrov, um, you know, in those years between. The first year that was the, the the crucial, you know, I'm not saying that the years since haven't been a crucial battle, but the first year that was the crucial battle, and him announcing his intentions to to try and play again in 2016. So we're probably talking between, two, you know, middle of 2013 and the middle of 2016. You know, seeing him at a couple of like charity events and fundraisers, and I remember having my photo taken with him. Um, you know, I can't remember which year it was, and still. Didn't look well, mm. to be honest. Um, and you, you, you're never thinking that that he was going to, you know, want to come and come and play play football again. Then one of my colleagues did did a story. I think he started playing playing Sunday league. Yeah, um, I remember the first first coming out from that. Yeah, and in being, I remember I think he interviewed like one of his teammates saying, "Oh, he's an absolute, he's an absolute pain." You know, he kind of <laughs> we're having to find everybody every week because they're not meeting his standards about kind of lateness and you know the the cleanliness of the boots and all this kind of stuff. Uh, he said it's brilliant to have him along, but he's such a nightmare, such a <laughs> headache. Um, so that was that was when you you got the sense that he. he he got his love. For, I don't think his love for football had ever gone, but he got the the bug back in terms of wanting wanting to play. Uh, but you did think, is that going to be, you know, where he plays? Hmm. Um, and then all of a sudden, it was the it was the the announcement that he he, he joined uh, Villa. Had obviously been been relegated in the in the May of two thousand sixteen. Yeah. New owner, new manager, um, new new squad in effect with the recruitment that went on and Petrov you know wanted to wanted to go through a grueling pre-season which mm. and not many players even like pre-season but Petrov's kind of it's different for him he's trying to get back um, I remember like I said those photos first dropped from him kind of making his way back into Sunday League or whatever 
obviously he's gained weight for obvious reasons and the medication side of things as well. And he's he was a big guy. He was I think in our interview with him, I've got it in my notes somewhere. It was in kilos though, so I had to translate it to stones. I don't know what kilos are. He said something was like he was 129 kilos when he thought about making a return, which, if Google is correct, is 20 stone. And he didn't look 20 stone, but I mean he was a big guy, and to even yeah. think at that time. I don't think he'd been 20 stone at that time. When I retired, I was 85 kilos, 13 and a half stone, according yeah. to Google. When I had to make a decision about even thinking about a po possible comeback, I was 129 kilos. Now, imagine through all the treatment that, uh, treatments that I had. I'd lost muscle, gained weight. I don't have endurance. I don't have stamina anymore. I'd lost everything and hadn't kicked a ball for three years. Maybe well, he, he he would know, he knows. know better than us, but that that decision would probably still have no, come, that was come a year, yeah. eighteen months before before he reported back for for pre season. Yeah. Um, so I think he said, didn't he, that he, he worked. Oh yeah, he didn't go back to pre season at twenty. No, yeah. no. <laughs> I was gonna say. So he goes through all that, which is, I mean, that's an incredible feat for anyone to lose that kind of weight. But to him to kind of get his football ability back, he's talking about going to these Sunday league games and stuff and playing with friends and kind of getting his his muscle memory back and his sharpness and at a time when all these like you know normal people and, and dads and stuff are kind of outdoing him, he's now back and looks like the ex professional footballer yeah. again. I'm pushing now. I'm in that zone now that I think I can do it. And by playing with friends, you know, when I was heavier, going and playing with friends, you can see they're faster than me. Some of them play in the lower league. Some of them are fitter and they, they can get away from me. But four or five months the line now, I became stronger. I become faster than them. Now like, you can see the difference. Now you can see that my awareness is back again, my touches, my, my quick feet my vision, everything is coming back now because it's just muscle memory. And I just had to make sure that I've got mentality again to, to work hard. So go through that and double sessions and heat and ice baths and all these things that he's talked about. I mean, like I said, normal players don't really like pre-season. A yeah. lot of them don't. So to put yourself and your body through that, to try and almost, you know, to prove a point and say, look, yeah. I'm ready to get back. It's just a testament to, to his character, isn't it? And, and his mental strength. Yeah, I actually think that's that's... That's the win there for me. Yeah. Obviously, yeah, obviously the that. win is in battling this illness and, you know, getting through it and still, you know, coming through the side and being a brilliant fellow and a brilliant family man, brilliant dad, brilliant husband. Um, but another big dub as the uh <laughs> Will you as, stop saying as big the dub? kids call it today. I'm just learning learning all the street lingo, mate. Another big dub is <laughs> Oh my dude. Um another another big victory for him is that pre season. Hmm. Just doing it and completing it and not being out of place and, and, and keeping up. With... I think his numbers and stuff were good, if I remember yeah. right, in terms of his fitness uh, levels and stuff. So, yeah, just just doing that was, was the thing. The boys would go and play cars. The boys would go and do this. The boys, I, I couldn't do it because I wasn't allowed to miss a, a second in the training. I wasn't allowed to miss a day because if I do that, they'll have an excuse to say no. I didn't do it. I've done complete. I've done every single run. I've done every single session. I was every day first. I was every day last. Stephen Petrov plays his first first friendly for Villa. I remember again the pictures of that coming out. The comparisons to the ones from the, the season the years before. It looks wifey. So it looks healthy. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, he's he's on. He's done it. He's he's got back. He, he's done the preseason. He's playing in friendlies. Give it another week or so, and he'll be in the competitive squad for for the championship. And away we go. Petrov, club captain, gets us promoted first season. What a fairy tale ending this is going to be. Back to Starport though. You were there for that again. Still reporting on stuff at the time. And there's a video clip that I'll put in of him getting mobbed at the end. How did he play though? Do you remember that? I remember that day really well because I feel like I, I, I drew the, the, the lucky uh, you know I won the toss that day if you like because um, did you not know where he was going to be? no they split the they split the team mm -hmm. they split the squad in half and half went to Telford yeah. and half went to um, to Starport and we sent Greg Greg Evans that day to Telford and I was the one who was um, going to Starport I remember because the, obviously the facilities were basic but we still wanted to try and live blog it so I didn't have my laptop I was doing it all by phone and I've got like a charging pack like, <laughs> or two charging packs in each of my <laughs> each of my pockets and like a notepad and like on a on a wheelie bin or whatever or 
And I remember meeting a, a Villa fan. It was a good atmosphere, and the Villa fans all kind of having having a drink. I might have even indulged in a pint myself that day in a plastic glass. I remember speaking to a Villa fan just randomly, and he he himself was going through. Um, cancer treatment oh, really? at, at the time and he was just saying you know he was desperate to try and get like Stan shirt or something or, or memento um, and I remember catching up with him at a later date somehow and he'd managed to get it and Stan had given him given him something and nice. he said how what what a right like a really big kind of inspirational moment it was for him in his own battle but um so that that day Petrov played he would have played Okay, you know, it would have been one of those ones where I think Villa ran out kind of easy, easy winners and Petrov would have been still snapping into tackles, still trying to get about as best he could. Um, wasn't brilliant, but wasn't didn't didn't look out of place. You didn't think, you know, who's this bloke that they've just yeah. thrown amongst these... Uh, it's still pre-season standard, isn't it? So, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and looked okay. That moment at the end when he got mobbed on the pitch... And I thought, you know, good mobile phone journalism, get get in amongst it, um, and and film this this outpouring of love for him. Really, I think there were probably chance of signing him up and that kind of thing. And I think he appreciated it. I remember, um, I remember his wife Paulina was was standing near the the little tunnel that goes into the like the clubhouse and the, the dressing room area uh, again with 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 Stan's kids, and you could just see like what it meant what it meant for for her and the family really for him to to see that that respect that's that respect is super close up how 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 close normally can a fan base get yeah. to a premier league player you know premier league games you can't get anywhere near really can you to to that degree but to actually kind of embrace him uh, on on the pitch was a was a really fantastic moment uh, back then we still thought there was a chance yeah. you know we, we we still thought that you know Dimitar's allowed him to, to join in in pre-season, has played him um, in pre-season as well. What's the next step? Where does it where does it go from here? What does he need to do now to to prove it? Uh, so, with what we know now, that's an even more poignant moment because that was probably a farewell mm. in itself. Obviously, I wasn't working working here done the pre-season he gets back he's in the kit as I said before he'll come back in the squad and Villa will go out first time I mean we were all deluded at the time weren't we thinking our oh, one season in the championship will be fine um, so I thought the next, the next natural step after seeing him in the shirt is the next time we'll hear from the club on Petrov will be contract announcement yeah. he'll be there with a pen in his hand signing or holding up the, the new shirt or whatever that's the next logical step here there's almost no way that he doesn't sign after he's yeah. featured four days later so the, the game's on the Saturday the Wednesday afterwards Villa post a tweet statement regarding Petrov, however it's worded, not going to be offered a contract. Um, I think he's offered some kind of coaching role yeah. that's that's mooted anyway by Di Matteo and the line is that Petrov will kind of consider that with family and, and get back to you, basically. Yeah. Were you surprised to see that? that? That he wouldn't be getting one or did you kind of think that the atmosphere at Starport, that it did feel a bit like a farewell for him? I'll tell you what surprised me. I was surprised that that decision was made and there was still a chunk of pre-season mm. to go. There. That was only the second pre-season game, I think. Yeah. So, in my mind, I mean, Di Matteo, maybe eventually we get him on here to... I've tried. So. To, to explain, but Di Matteo is the only one who will be able to really know. But to me, the fact that that decision was made after friendly number one suggests that this was in Di Matteo's mind, unless Spe Petrov did something absolutely spectacular to change his mind otherwise this was going to be I'll do this for the for the sake of the guy so he can he can sh he can have that pre-season he mm. can show that he can still still live with with a group of pro professional players I'll give him a game so that he can feel the love of the the Villa fan base but after that we're moving on. I mean, that's almost worse in a way, isn't it? That the kind of creating, unless it was said between them. Although we've spoken to Petrov, yeah. and that wasn't the, the sense yeah. I got from him that it was kind of pre-agreed. Yeah. You'll play one friendly, but that's it. It's almost a bit of a false hope to have him top all the charts in fitness, play this first game, and then four days later. I mean, I don't know how quickly Petrov was told after the game. Obviously, yeah. fans found out four days later. That's what, that's pretty ruthless. Just to go, oh, yeah, I'm not going to offer you anything. It is. Uh, I think for Petrov, I don't think this was ever a PR stunt. This was this no, was something this was something serious that he thought he could achieve, and he he came pretty damn close 
to achieving it. It is difficult to kind of have two sides of the story. We only know Petrov's side, and he is was hurt by it. I think he yeah. said even you know, a month, to, months to a year afterwards, he was still hurt by the decision. Or he said, "Kind of, I've dealt with it now." Six yeah. years later, but yeah, I know football is a ruthless game, and you've got to be harsh about stuff. But it almost would have felt better to have not given him that preseason game, to not give him that kind of false hope. If you know you're not going to have him around anyway. I don't know, it's difficult. It feels like there aren't many situations where Di Matteo can lose in that situation when, you know, fan favourite comes back, makes miraculous recovery from illness to play. Yeah. There aren't many scenarios that play out where Di Matteo is the loser there and he picked the one where he is the loser. I think the interesting thing that I would love to have known or still love to know is what was the threshold? What would he have had to have done to win that contract score from the halfway line <laughs> <laughs> I think he could have managed that uh, I probably could have done that at Starport. Um so I think I think the, the big thing is that conversation at some stage is has to be had between Di Matteo and Petrov A what was the threshold B what what was Petrov expecting mm. in terms of would Petrov have taken a kind of pay as you play arrangement would, I don't think he can't. I think Petrov would have wanted to have been treated equally mm. by like the rest of the players in that dressing room. Yeah, but saying, they're not going to give him a three year deal, are they? No, well, I mean, I'm not saying they'd have given him a three year deal, but if they could have given him a year's deal, I think there would have still been some expectation on Petrov's part that I get a fair, fair crack of the whip to, mm. to prove to you every day in training uh, and on match days that. that I, I, I'm not just here as a, a sentimental gesture. I'm here because I can be an important part of the dressing room. Dimitar would, for some reason, Dimitar didn't think that was the case. So, as fans, we probably think, "Oh, come on, Roberto! You know, you know, get him involved, even if he only plays for um, half a dozen games." I don't think Dimitar or Petrov, as professional football men with distinguished quick careers be behind them, would have wanted to go into it. In those terms, mm. I know Petrov said about you know even just playing one minute of professional football again kind of it gives uh, inspiration to people going through difficult times and all those kind of things and that was his ambition for getting back to prove that you know it can be done and even as you know, touch wood there's nothing physically wrong with me illness wise I watched some of the Petrov podcast that we did with him back before we did this and I was thinking. I need to go for a run or something. Like, if, if he can go through all that and, and get himself back in the shape, what's my excuse kind of thing? So, you know, inspiration to, to anybody, not just people going through through difficult spells with their with their um, with illnesses and things like that. Um, I just don't. What I don't get, and Petrov said the same. I've seen him say it in a few places. I don't get why the decision was made so soon. Yeah. He was a free agent. He wasn't contracted to anybody. He could have done another couple of months of, of fitness work and then offered a, a, a one month contract in in January or whatever, and then come back that way. Or I, mean, I think you can do a free agent any time. But I don't know why it had to be done. First of all, in pre season, but never mind four days after his first first game. Either he could have. Even yeah, that's why. That's what makes me think it was already decided in Di Matteo's mind. Mm, that's um, just strange. You know, I'm not. This is not a dig out Roberto Di Matteo podcast. But while we're here, it kind of is. <laughs> while we're here, pretty much most of the things that he that he did in those first two or three months, or those only two or three months in charge of, of Aston Villa, subsequently turned out to be, you know, there wasn't a great deal of, of successful decisions mm -hmm. made during that time. Didn't have a great twelve weeks, did he, or whatever and, it was. And I do come at this very much from a, an Aston Villa fan's point of view. What's the worst that could happen by giving that's Petrov what, that deal? That's what I mean. I don't think there was any scenario where Di Matteo comes out of this as, as the loser, yeah. as the bad guy of the piece, yeah. but but this scenario. Because Petrov's not going to, let's say, I mean, at the time I wrote a big piece, he would have wanted to be all in or all out. I don't think he'd have wanted to just come on for the last minute to a couple of minutes away at Sheffield Wednesday in that first game in the championship just to clap the Villa fans and that mm, be it. And then retire. Um I don't think I don't think that was his his intentions at all. Um but having said that, Di Matteo had the option of, like you say, giving Petrov another month, another six months behind the scenes to prove himself and say okay, you've done that over a pre-season, you've done it over six weeks, let's see where you're at if you train with us every single day for yeah, six yeah. months and the intensity. And if during that six months' time you prove to me and the people around and my coaches that you can compete, you know, 
the door will be open. Um, I think for him to shut the door so quickly again what's the worst that could happen if Petrov would have wouldn't have done that you can say right we've had a good look at it we've given you a fair crack of the whip you go with our best wishes there's still a coaching yeah offer. if he would have done that and Petrov would have in, would have impressed and Petrov would have come on for a 15 minute cameo Petrov wouldn't uh, wouldn't wouldn't have put himself up for that if he thought oh I'm going to come on for a 15 minute cameo give the ball away to the opposition <laughs> you know 10 times and lose us the game Petrov wouldn't have wanted that um so it just it seems a very a very quick, very blunt, Short very very also. harsh decision, very quickly, and with the benefit of hindsight, when we look at the context of <laughs> Dimitar's reign as a whole over those couple of months, again, what's the worst that could have happened? It might have come a little bit too soon for for Petrov in terms of I mean playing against Worcester City at Starport and playing against Sheffield Wednesday yeah. in the Championship in a tough Championship season yeah. for Villa as we now know. When you're talking about Tish Bowler, Westwood, Gary Gardner, Bakuna, people like that, could Petrov not have done a job in there? People like Glenn Whelan and Mila Yedinak who were professional, still in good shape, good fit, Midfield players who bought experience and, and and bought that bought that professionalism, they actually proved to be an important part mm. in getting Villa, you know, moving moving Villa in the right direction towards towards promotion. Ultimately, um, could Petrov not have been classed? You know, listen, they'd gone from playing Premier League football yeah. for a lot of years, not having to go through. The, the health battles that still in and the, the mental psychological battles that Petrov had gone. So it's not comparing like for like, but in terms of an influence to in a dressing room mm. and still very good technical footballers who've kept themselves in good shape and can still offer something, is Petrov not that kind of could he have not been that kind of Mila in it two years earlier. Yeah, 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 in effect. I mean we don't know the insights into what the dressing room was like that year, but I struggle to, to conceive a way where a, a classy, standard-setting Stylian Petrov doesn't make that championship season at least go a little bit smoother than it did. Maybe Di Matteo would have been in a job for longer if he could have controlled that yeah. that nucleus of a squad yeah. better with someone like Stan at the helm. Yeah. But so listen, I don't know who was who was signing the checks back then. I'm sure <laughs> just Tony Shaw and Keith Warner who was signing the checks back there. But in hindsight. Stylian Petrov, 2016-17. Why not pay him for a year as a player coach? Mm. We will give you six months to prove the player side of it. If it works, brilliant. If not, the, this dressing room will still have seen the benefit of your your professionalism, yeah. and then we can discuss in January whether you are you you remain a player coach, whether you become a player rather than a coach, whether you become a coach rather than a player, or whether we we shake your hand and wish you well with your journey yeah. that to me would have seemed a sensible way of doing it obviously that didn't happen there's I think there's still there's a little bit of bitterness and resentment from from Stan although I think he's a grown up mature enough uh, adult to have been able to absorb that and to to process that there's a lot of bitterness from from Gabby Bollahor who was <laughs> big big mates of um, big mates of Stan I think gave him a lot of support during that that pre-season mm. uh, physically uh, pushed him up yeah I think yeah runs, yeah right? really really supportive I don't know whether he told us off air or not obviously it was me and Ash did that one I seem to remember him calling Di a nugget I don't know whether that was like an off air. He looks these food insults, then he called me a sausage the yeah, other week. Did yeah. a nugget? Sausage and nuggets, yeah. Yeah, but I couldn't find it. But I mean, that uh, might have prolonged his own villa career if he just <laughs> called people this rather than <laughs> filled his face with it. <laughs> um, All right, Gabby. <laughs> what Dean Matteo done by not giving them a contract was criminal. Stan done all pre season. He done so much to get back into shape after his um, horrible illness. And I think any manager with any sort of heart pays you play. Stan wouldn't have been bothered about the, the, the money that he would have been playing. Do you know what I mean? He loved Villa. Give him a pay-as-you-play deal or something and, and let him play. Do you know what I mean? He still had a couple of seasons left in him. And I think any other manager with a heart would have done that. That's why like, I'll always dislike Dean Matteo anyway. But for that reason, I'll always dislike him because Stan wasn't finished yet. Do you know what I mean? He had, he, had, he had two more years left in him. And even when I play with him now, you look at his quality. Like, 
wow, he could have definitely played two more years, holding mid, spraying balls about and starting off attacks. Do you know what I mean? So it's um, just a shame that he didn't get that chance to do it. It was Villa or nothing for him, mm. wasn't it? Yeah. In the end. And I think in his mind, a hopeless old romantic that he is, he'd got this Hollywood ending in mind where he could play a part in getting Aston Villa back into the Premier League. Yeah. Because that was that was the dream. That was the thought that Villa were going to challenge that year. It was going to be one season only in the championship. And I don't think I don't think Stan would have had the ego enough to think that he had to be the captain and he had to play every single week. But I yeah. think he had the self belief to think that he could play an integral part on and off the pitch in that. So when that didn't happen, you know, there was no thoughts of him rocking up at Port Vale and going and going and prove himself there. Yeah. Uh, I think it needed to be, you know, this has become my club. You know, I'm synonymous with Aston Villa. Okay, yeah, I've had a really successful time at Celtic uh, and in Bulgaria before then, but this is my club, and the way that I want to, I, I want to repay this club for supporting me through the toughest, toughest few years of my life, is by getting getting this club back on track, being an inspirational role model to other people who have had to had to go through this illness or who are going through this illness to show them that anything's possible and I think as soon as that was taken away from him I think he thought okay you know I'm not happy with that decision I disagree with it I've done everything that I can to to prove you wrong and to prove that I can still still be this um, Aston Villa player and Aston Villa ambassador but I think from then he thought next stage of my life Hmm. you know thank you for supporting me I've given it the best crack that, that I possibly can I'm going to have to have to move on with it. It's it's a little bit silly, isn't it? But I remember when we did the podcast with him, and there's a clip in there. Where I think I think you, you you've clipped it for social in the past, where I was saying about how some of his some some former Villa managers and players are, are not my biggest fans. Mm. And, uh, you say why why, why does every, why does every, why does everybody hate you, Matt? I don't <laughs> hate you or something like that. You're a good guy. <laughs> Honestly, if I could, I'd plaster that across my LinkedIn page, across my CV. I'd have it playing on a big screen in my home because it was such to know that, you know, I've got, even if it's just a smidgen of respect from a, from a fella like that, um, I can't have been too, doing too badly. Yeah, no, imagine you're a 22 year old football in the championship where he pulls you to the dressing room and says the same things. He, he dro- drive you to promotion. <laughs> Bloody Di Matteo. Exactly. Why does everybody hate you, Gary Gardner? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it for our uh, Villa Rewind episode two, uh, the inspiring story of Cillian Petrov's attempted comeback or whatever title I end up going with later down the line. Uh, I'm keen to see the people's thoughts for the, those are watching. I now did a, a social media thread of should he get a new contract or should he have got a new contract? He won't get one yeah. now, will he, at 43? Um, so, yeah, if you want to get involved in the comment section down below, I want to hear your thoughts as well. Um, but yeah, Matt, thanks for your time as always. Enjoyed yeah, it. And if um, if Roberto Di Matteo is in in the Ford Mondeo in the general Rome area with Tony Shaw, get in touch and let us know. I'd love in. to get I'd love to get his side of the story, but yeah, I think I tried it through an agency and they weren't they yeah. weren't keen. So. Nah, mate. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll leave that there. <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much for watching this episode of the Claret and Blue podcast, and uh, we'll catch you again soon. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue and Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode, but until then, up the villa. Up the villa.